So listen to this, over the last few months, here and there, I've begun hearing some rumors that sounded so outlandish that at first I barely even paid any attention to them. But I kept seeing them again and again and soon I was intrigued. Liverpool players were repeatedly spotted carrying Hazma inhalers. This could sound harmless at first but in reality it turns out there's a whole conspiracy behind it. As much as they are in fact only asthma inhalers, it turns out that their usage by top athletes in perfect health has been considered doping by many sports scientists and that this sort of controversy has taken other sports by storm from track and field to cycling. Honestly, anything to do with endurance and considering players can run up to 10 kilometers a match, clearly football is at stake too. As crazy as it sounds, we could be on the verge of our very own doping scandal, but so far, it seems like no one is talking about it or working to find out how much truth is behind these statements, which is at the very least very suspicious. So as always, I'm going to go the extra mile today and show you everything there is to know about the Liverpool doping conspiracy. Let's go! So first of all, let's get one thing out of the way. Every sport in the world has had doping scandals, but for some reason, when it comes to football, everybody just seems to prefer to turn a blind eye to the whole possibility when in fact, if you look for it, there's no difficulty in finding some high-profile cases. In 2001, the Dutch national team was accused of doping when three of their top most physically imposing players, Edgar Davids, Frank de Boer and Yap Sam, were all found to be positive for anabolic steroids, but of course, then they came out blaming, well, the cows, I guess. They said the only reason steroids were present in their bodies was because the livestock was being fed steroids and they just traveled all the way up the food chain. I don't want to be condescending, but surely eating the same beef that's available to the entire population didn't contaminate your body with enough steroids to get flagged in a doping test. And clearly, FIFA agreed because all of them got banned for a while. And if you go back another decade, Juventus did much worse. They hired a neuropathologist whose sources claim at a locker room set up like a small hospital, supplying players with any kind of over-the-counter drug if found to have a performance-enhancing effect, from muscle relaxants to pain killers and even antidepressants, with players like Zidane, Del Piero and Conte all being involved in the case which eventually ended with 22 months in prison for the doctor, as well as 22 months without practicing medicine and a fine. So yeah, hopefully knowing this now we won't for a second doubt that football is in no way a safe haven when it comes to doping. And so, let's get into how all of this started. An article came out very nonchalantly claiming that 63% of Liverpool players had been diagnosed with asthma and been prescribed medication for it, as well as claiming that they are loading on extremely high doses of caffeine before every match, a method they referred to as super dosing, which sounds a lot like doping, doesn't it? So what everyone quickly pointed out was there's absolutely zero way in hell that nearly a third of the Liverpool squad has asthma. If you need some numbers to back that up, let me tell you that only about 12% of the population in the United Kingdom has that same condition. Some people still argue that there's a type of asthma called exercise-induced asthma, which, as the name sort of implies, is especially common in pro athletes, meaning that perhaps that's why so many of them are on those drugs. But well, even among pro athletes, the prevalence of that kind of asthma is claimed to be only around 35%. So once again, it doesn't add up, it could serve as a way to soften the blow, but it doesn't account for the whole thing. So if all those players are taking those drugs, it's pretty obvious there's some other reason to that besides just asthma treatment, and it's pretty obvious some doctor out there is in some way being influenced to be extra lenient with his diagnosis, if you catch my drift. However, that was pretty much everything everything that came out with that first article, so no one really thought much about it, but as the time passed by, more and more fans claimed to have spotted players carrying the inhalers, with Ben Davis being the main culprit, being caught red-handed carrying one that the fans quickly identified as Simbacort, an inhaler commonly prescribed alongside salbutanol, which is the most common substance found in asthma treatments that have been claimed to have performance-enhancing effects. Adding that extra bit of credibility the claims were in need of, but also launching some football circles on social media into full tin hat mode. The conspiracy was becoming real and the opinions began coming out. 
Everyone claimed that every other team struggle to imitate Liverpool's aggressive, high-pressing, high-intensity, lightning-quick play style was evidence that there was more to it than it was observable at first sight. People even claimed it was especially suspicious how in the first season after Jurgen Klopp's arrival, it was frequently discussed that his play style was infeasible due to how intense it was on the players, but then, out of nowhere, in the second season they were literally breaking the all-time record for most distance covered in a Premier League League match, and it began looking like it wasn't a problem for them anymore, with the team completely breezing through the expectations and outperforming even the demands of Jurgen Klopp. And if somehow you think that distance covered isn't that big of a selling point for Klopp's system, then let me tell you that at Dortmund he set a goal for the team to hit 120 km per match, even allowing them to skip a day of training each week as a reward whenever they hit that goal. He's even been quoted saying to the players that if you run 120 km, it's virtually impossible to lose. I don't know about you, but that sounds scary to me. One of the things that fascinates me about this whole situation is how in a way it's kind of bulletproof. Considering the diagnosis of asthma can be relatively arbitrary or at the very least very open to interpretation and that got me asking if there had been other cases of diseases like this being exploited in other sports in order to acquire legitimate medical prescriptions for players who didn't need them and well, yeah, there have definitely been other cases. For example, in baseball, with a ball flying towards you in a bleep, having fast reaction times is a huge part of the sport and once doping tests became a thing, stimulants became less and less common and the performances of players suffered. Until someone noticed that if a player was diagnosed with ADHD, a mental illness that causes restlessness and a difficulty in concentrating, they would be given an exemption that allowed them to take Adderall which is essential for someone with ADHD as it helps them focus, but when prescribed to a neurotypical patient, will kind of give them superpowers, with increased reaction times and heightened awareness, which was completely game-breaking, so much so that soon the World Doping Agency's chairman would refer to the subject sarcastically, saying it's quite incredible how out of nowhere, Major League Baseball seems to have a rampant ADHD epidemic. He would also say that he could count in one hand the number of players who actually have ADHD, while at the time nearly 10% of the league was on Adderall already, which as you might imagine led to a huge revamping of doping laws with the substance eventually being completely outlawed. It's actually an incredible story, I know it's not football, but it definitely seemed worthy of a mention. And actually, on that note, let's also say that at the Olympics, these asthma medications have also started to run rampant and become a problem, even all the way back in 2008, when Dara Torres took over the swimming events at the Olympics, winning four medals at 41 years of age. Her secret? Well, months before the Olympics, she had earned herself a medical exemption for salbutamol. The same asthma medication found in nearly every other case of potential doping, which has been subject to higher debate with some studies claiming its effects are negligible when used by healthy subjects, while others claim it's almost like Popeye spinach, sending your airways into hyperdrive and allowing for not only increased endurance but also increased strength and improved sprinting time. It's kind of insane, it's become so widespread to the point where you can find first-hand accounts of track and field amateur athletes claiming to be aware of many others who have tried to fake their tests in order to be prescribed these meds and improve their times. Though it should be noted that the World Doping Agency is actually taking steps towards banning these sort of drugs which are classified as what they call beta-2 agonists and just seem to be on a whole other level. But getting back to football, one thing has to be said, this most likely isn't just a Liverpool thing. Even if you stick to just the Premier League, it's easy to see that even their main rivals have had struggles with doping scandals. Pep Guardiola himself was literally handed a 7-month suspended sentence while playing at Brescia after steroids were detected in his system. So clearly doping isn't something far outside of his moral grey area. And right across Manchester, midfielder Fred has literally been banned for a full year for the usage of a masking agent back in his time at Shakhtar Donetsk. And in my opinion, this sort of thing could be even scarier. Masking agents, as the name suggests, allow for the use of other substances to go undetected, specifically steroids, which are mainly known for the strength gains they provide but are also incredibly efficient at reducing the recovery times after an injury. 
And this has actually led to another branch of this conspiracy, with many people in social media making sure to highlight how they feel the Liverpool squad has been suspiciously injury free. However, in my opinion, this one is surely unfounded considering Liverpool went through an absurd injury crisis in the 2021 season, losing everyone from Van Dijk, Firmino, Mane and Jota. However, there's no denying that doping is rooted in football when Stanley Matthews, the first ever Ballon d'Or winner, was a known methamphetamine user and police officers in 1954 wrote in their notes that after West Germany pulled off a huge upset by defeating Ferenc Puskas Hungary in the final of the World Cup, their locker room floor was littered with dozens of syringes which seemed to contain the same methamphetamines given to the German soldiers in World War II. And it seems no matter how many anti-doping policies are established, things just won't change. In 2016, an ex-player named Lofty El Bosidi decided to publish a paper in which he anonymously interviewed hundreds of players he had met regarding their experiences with doping. This was motivated by the amount of times El Bosidi himself had been given pills and IV drips which the clubs claimed contained only vitamins but always ended up making him feel like he had gone into hyperdrive. Once all the respondents had gotten back to him, his suspicions had been proven true, with around 20% of players claiming they believed to have been doped over the last year, with the Swedish league being the cleanest, while the Spanish and German leagues were the dirtiest. Furthermore, the results also display just how faulty the current anti-doping landscape is, since nearly half of the players claim they had not been tested in the last year and only 7% claiming to have been tested more than once, with the average player across Europe being tested only only every three and a half years, meaning that the supposed regular testing they claim to have implemented in football is nothing more than a facade and that a lot, like a lot of players who have taken performance enhancing drugs have gone completely undetected. And all of this doesn't even really take into account corruption because trust me, in this world of match fixing, bribing of officials and god knows what, you better believe that many of the world's top clubs have the anti-doping agencies dangling from their fingertips. Just a few years ago, documents were found that proved that the Russian national team had bribed every agency in the book in order to make sure that their squad was completely invulnerable to doping tests anytime they played a World Cup qualification match in their homeland. It's insane how things really are. To wrap this up, I have a question for you. One thing I saw a lot of people saying regarding this subject was quite simply, who cares, you know? They're superhumans already, so if football players are taking drugs to become even better than they are, isn't that the point of sports, of competition, to do everything in your power to get that last 1% in order to wedge out everyone else? Well, though I do see the point in a way, I mean, Football is indeed at the end of the day just a show, a spectacle and if these drugs make it more interesting, I mean, Liverpool are a phenomenal watch, then why not? Well, I'm playing devil's advocate obviously. In my opinion, if you think that, then you're gonna get caught in a slippery slope because if your answer to this situation is just why not, then why not steroids as well? The answer is simple to me. Football is pure. It's the most accessible sport in the world. It was born in the streets out of the dreams and imagination of every kid in the world. It's an art form and it should be kept that way, with every idol playing on the same level as every young aspiring footballer.